first off say hello. Um, again, I'm Helen from the Human Rights Consortium and welcome to the first in our series of webinars called COVID Conversations, Human Rights in a Pandemic. The Human Rights Consortium is delighted to be partnering with both the Transitional Justice Institute and also the Equality Coalition to look more closely at some of the human rights issues that have been highlighted by the pandemic. As with the topic of childcare today, all the issues we'll be examining in this series existed before COVID-19, but each of them has been exacerbated by the crisis. So thank you all for joining us today to be part of this, what we think is a really important conversation. A few bits of housekeeping. Firstly, I think we can all agree that it's difficult to focus for too long on a webinar. So we're trying really consciously to keep each one of these below one hour. We're gonna hear from each of our spe three speakers in turn for 10 minutes each. And then we're going to open it up to questions and conversations for about 15 minutes. We'll keep everyone who isn't speaking on mute, so please keep yourselves on mute unless you're asking a question. Um, if you would like to answer a question, anything occurs to you while people are speaking, please just enter it into the chat box, which again is along that bottom bar if you're using a laptop. Um, if you're having issues with bandwidth, which is internet access is another issue for another day to do with human rights, um, please do try turning off your video, that should help. And again, we're recording the webinar with a view to upload it online. So if you don't want to appear, you might want to turn your video off, although I have it on speaker view, so it should only be people speaking who appear. Um, Um, we're, we are initially running three webinars in this series to see if there's an appetite for the content. So after the event, if everybody's happy enough, and this is the last you'll hear of us on this, we are going to send out a quick feedback form. And we'd hugely appreciate it if you're able to take a few minutes to fill it in and return it. That will help us decide whether to run more events and what areas people would like to see covered. And so now to the rights to childcare. Provision of childcare in Northern Ireland has long been an issue at the forefront of the women's movement in Northern Ireland. And that was most recently highlighted by the excellent feminist recovery plan that was released last week. The Nevin Economic Research Institute recently reported that 350,000 workers in Northern Ireland have dependent children. In a place with a population of less than 2 million, that's a huge number. And while ch childcare is certainly about the economy and a way to allow parents and guardians to work, it's also about much more. Childcare settings are places where children exercise their own rights, such as the right to play and to education. Childcare providers in all their various forms are workers with their own rights that must be respected, protected and realised. We're going to hear from three women today, each of whom is an expert in their own area. They speak from a very different aspect of the right to childcare each, and although we won't be able to take an exhaustive look at the rights of childcare in an hour, I know we're in for a really interesting event. So just like to say thank you to each of our speakers for giving their time and expertise to be part of this conversation. And let me first welcome Aoife Hamilton from Employers for Childcare. Aoife heads Employers for Childcare's award-winning charity. This includes the Family Benefits Advice Service, which provides expert advice and guidance on a wide range of childcare and work-related issues. The charity also carries out highly regarded research, providing a solid evidence base to lobby government on childcare, family and work related concerns. Aoife was instrumental in securing the UK wide extension of the childcare voucher scheme, helping to break down the barrier that lack of affordable childcare presents to working parents underpins her work at the charity, whose ethos is to address childcare not only as a social issue, but also as a labour market and economic issue. Aoife is one of the cool conveners of the Child Care for All campaign and is part of the Child Care Reference Group, advising the Departments of Health and Education on the response to COVID-19. So without further ado, Aoife, if you want to unmute yourself and take the floor. Super. Helen, thank you very much um, and thank you for that introduction. So for those um, not familiar with Employers for Child Care, just briefly, we're a social enterprise and charity supporting parents to get into work and stay in work. Um, we offer a free um, confidential family benefits advice service and research policy work and lobbying. So my focus today um, of the three is probably going to be the policy context within which we're working to address the right to childcare. 
and I'm delighted to be participating in this webinar. Um, I think it really reflects the growing focus being placed on the vital role of childcare, yes to our economy, but to society as a whole. Um, and as Helen said, it was a move we were starting to see before COVID, but what we can now see is how much the pandemic has served to strengthen the case for reinforcing greater recognition of childcare as an essential part of our infrastructure at the forefront of economic recovery efforts, but also key in supporting children who are going to have missed so much early education this year. But we recognise the challenges to seeing the policies and resources that are needed being implemented. So pre-COVID, Northern Ireland was already long overdue a childcare strategy. 10 years of our research had showed clearly parents were struggling to access and afford the childcare they needed. And providers from self-employed childminders to large day nurseries were finding it increasingly difficult to make ends meet. Um, our latest survey results showed that in 2019, almost a third of providers anticipated their economic situation would worsen in the coming year and we hadn't even heard of COVID at that point. But some positive progress was um, starting to be seen. Um, so we had the new decade new approach agreement which recognised the importance of childcare. The Childcare for All campaign was established and in March we were delighted that the Assembly passed a motion on the provision of free childcare in Northern Ireland. And more recently, an all party group on early education and childcare has been formally constituted. But these are important and overdue developments which are likely to be delayed as a result of COVID. Last week, it was frustrating to read in response to an assembly question that the implementation of our childcare strategy could take a number of years to deliver. And as well as delaying progress, COVID will only exacerbate challenges already within the system. So a loss of provision, for example, could impact on availability. We could see an increase in cost for providers and for parents. So with significant work undertaken to respond to the immediate crisis, we have seen the Departments of Health and Education coming together to assist providers to open and remain open in April, May and June, initially to provide care for the children of key workers. And we saw a lot of child minders in particular remain open at that point. Since then, a further round of funding, 10.5 million, has been allocated for providers in July and August. And many have been able to reopen to more children and from more families as restrictions have eased. This is critical in building the capacity of the sector to provide care. And I would encourage any provider to find out more about support if they're not sure. However, it's important to say these schemes have been far from perfect. So in the initial months, funds were too slow to get out to providers. In the second round, while the process is much better, it's clear that too small a proportion has been allocated to childminders. And while a childcare recovery plan has now been published, it was a glaring omission not to include childcare in the executive's original plan for recovery from COVID. And I think we can expect new and greater challenges as we look ahead. So come the end of this month in September, for parents of school-aged children, will children be back full or part-time? How will that look? How will it interact with childcare? And for parents who would not usually have had to pay for childcare at this time, how will they afford the additional costs? Um, will some parents have to take unpaid leave? Can they request flexibility from their employer? But if this is not possible, we've already spoken to parents who feel they have no option but to leave the workplace. Many providers are also still uncertain about their own capacity and their future. Will they have fewer families wanting to use services? Um, will they be inundated with requests on certain days and quiet on others? And then what if there's another wave of the virus? What will happen at that point and how can we be better prepared? So lots of questions and still much uncertainty. And these are the subject of ongoing work and considerations. But I do think there's an opportunity as well. This is a time of unprecedented investment in key infrastructure to assist in our economic and societal recovery from COVID. And I think if we can really hit home that childcare is part of our key infrastructure and of critical importance to enable economic recovery, childcare needs to be part of that investment. If a parent cannot access affordable childcare, they're not going to be able to work. It's as simple and as stark as that. Stepping beyond the economic recovery, Funds we know are going to be stretched for many years and I think that's where in terms of competing priorities it's really helpful to look at childcare through the lens of human rights. And that includes a child's right to access quality childcare that gives them the best start in life and plays a key role in lifting their family out of poverty. 
than a parent's right to access affordable, flexible childcare that enables them to go to work or invest time in their own education and training. And a childcare worker's right to a decent wage for what is skilled, critical work. And when we talk about these rights, they must apply across the board, whether a parent um, is, lives in a rural area, whether a child has a disability or is from a lower income household, um, a single parent or a care provider is from a minority ethnic background. These are all um, important rights to consider. Otherwise, we run the risk of entrenching existing inequalities that can arise from the lack of affordable, flexible and sustainable childcare for all. And there's a clear body of evidence um, which demonstrates that an inability to access affordable childcare is a barrier to accessing employment for women in particular. And this was something that the UN Committee on the Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women concluded last year during its formal examination of the UK government when it specifically referenced the importance of ensuring affordable and accessible childcare in Northern Ireland. So looking ahead now, I really do appreciate that there is a focus currently on the pandemic and how we respond to that. But I think it's worth reflecting that an entire generation of children has been born, has progressed through the school system and into adulthood since the last full childcare strategy was published in Northern Ireland. This and subsequent generations of parents and children and providers need to see progress and that is their right. So it's not good enough that for a third of families here, it costs more to have their children cared for while they work than it does to keep a roof over their heads. And nor is it right that providers delivering high quality care are struggling to make ends meet. So without further government intervention and long term investment, we insufficiently value and recognise this sector, the importance of which any parents who are dialing in or working from home are now all too familiar with. This is a professional sector whose workforce has a unique set of skills that will be jeopardised should providers, childminders or workers see their businesses and jobs eroded in front of them. So that's what we're going to continue to work on um, to achieve the changes that parents and providers have been telling us for a long number of years is needed and ensure it's underpinned by a comprehensive, fully costed childcare strategy, which actually delivers and critically is underpinned by legislation and embeds the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And I would advocate for a rights-based approach, starting with the rights of individuals, so that we can establish, I'm just going to finish with this, a number of key objectives for the strategy. So first, for children. Children have a right to access high quality childcare that meets their educational and developmental needs in a safe environment, supporting them to achieve their full potential. And no child is living in poverty as a result of a parent's inability to access or stay in work. For parents, all parents have the right to access, stay in and progress in paid work, education and training facilitated by affordable, accessible childcare. For childcare providers, all types of provider are enabled to deliver high quality, sustainable, accessible childcare across a range of settings through investment in the sector. And our workforce is valued and supported through investment in skills development, workplace progression, pay and terms and conditions. And for society and our economy as a whole, there's a significant reduction in the gender pay gap and social inequality through ensuring no one's employment options are constrained by lack of access to affordable, flexible childcare. And that in turn will stimulate economic growth through employers having access to a wider pool of skilled, experienced, potential employees for recruitment. Everyone in our society relies on public services in some way every day, and that is our right. Affordable, accessible childcare is simply another essential service. And we can get this right with a childcare strategy that shows evidence of the learning both pre-COVID and from this experience of the pandemic. And doing so will ensure that our childcare infrastructure in Northern Ireland is a key to unlocking barriers to those rights I set out earlier parents participating and progressing in work, particularly women, and families who are in work maximising their incomes, nurturing our children's potential, providing an opportunity for early intervention and development, and helping us all to achieve the outcomes that we as a society know are right. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Eva. That was wonderful. Um, next off, 
I am going to invite Louise Coyle from Northern Ireland Rural Women Network to speak. Louise is the director of the Northern Ireland Rural Women's Network and Nerwin was established in September 2006 to promote and support rural women in rural Northern Ireland. Nerwin is a membership-based organisation whose mission is to amplify and articulate the voice of rural women at local, regional, strategic level. Louise has worked in the organisation since its since its inception and prior to this worked in both the community, voluntary and statutory sectors. Through her role as advocate for rural women, Louise has made representations to local government in, and also to Westminster, Dublin, Europe and has also engaged in civil society representations to the United Nations in Geneva and New York. Nerwin's Rural Voices Research report conducted over a conducted through over a year of direct engagement with members, illustrated very clearly that rural women's participation in every sphere of life is being impeded by lack of accessible, affordable, flexible childcare options. So without further ado, I would like to ask Louise Coyle to unmute and take the stage. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Um, Thank you for the introduction, Helen, and thank you for the invitation to speak this morning about childcare. Um, childcare is one of the biggest, consistently biggest issues raised by our members with us. And it'll be no surprise to any of you that during um, the pandemic and lockdown that it, it was exacerbated for everybody whilst we were all at home and um, we, we weren't those of us who had access to childcare previously were having to deal with no access to childcare and potentially also working from home and trying to educate our children by ourselves. Um, uh, I'm going to have a chat just about how, these, how childcare is really impacted slightly differently in rural areas. Aoife has covered really comprehensively um, the, 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 the overview of, of the impact of um, lack of accessible, affordable childcare and why we need it so badly. I want to really focus in on um, how it impacts in rural areas in Northern Ireland. And we are 40% of Northern Ireland is rural. So that's quite a percentage. But when you think about how rural is resourced, we certainly don't receive 40% of the resourcing or even the thinking and the policy planning that goes on in Northern Ireland. And um, it impacts on, on access poverty. To, we have access poverty to almost everything and that includes childcare. Um, I will be making some reference to both our Rural Voices Research Report, also to the Women's Policy Group Amazing Feminist Recovery Plan. If you haven't read it, please do. I'd say that for our Rural Voices Report too, naturally. Um, both of those are available on the Nurban website um, and in lots of other places as well. Um, and also I have a few stats from um, the Child Care Cost Survey done by um, EFA's organisation, the Employers for Child Care. So, in rural areas, um, we have traditionally a culture, well, across Northern Ireland, but most specifically in rural areas, of the burden of caring landing at the feet of women. Um, the culture in our rural areas is if there are children that need cared for, if there are older people that need cared for, no matter who it is that needs the extra care, um, that responsibility falls to women. And therefore, that's how childcare becomes a women's issue. When in actual fact, it's an economic issue, it's a family issue, it's, you know, it's an issue as a society, and yet it is women who are left to, to bear the burden of that. Um, in terms of rural areas as well, you know, women who don't have access to childcare can become very isolated if they're providing you know, covering the care and responsibilities at home. Their exclusion from participating fully in social and economic um, life and community-based activities, all of those things become so much more difficult to participate if you cannot access any form of childcare. Um, and flexible, affordable, accessible childcare can be exceedingly difficult to find in rural areas. And that's even if you can afford it, you still can't even find it sometimes. Um, and the distance from our work um, can often mean that rural women's childcare needs to start earlier in the day and end later in the day, which also has an impact on the child. And let's not, I know we're a women's organization, our focus is, is women, but 
obviously childcare is about children also and the quality of childcare that they receive and no mother wants to be leaving their child for exceedingly long days um, in, in childcare settings no matter how good a quality they are so it impacts on our decision making and um, so it's sometimes up to two hours a, more a day um, our members will be telling us than, than comparable urban families and that can make also childcare unaffordable and absolutely a work-life balance completely unrealistic um, both for ourselves and for our children um, and the employers for childcare childcare costs um, report for 2019 um, gives the example of families in County Fermanagh are using more hours of childcare and are spending more a week than families in other parts of Northern Ireland despite the fact that the childcare costs tend to be lower and there's probably something in that and I um, that maybe the costs are lower because people just simply wouldn't be able to afford it at all if they need that many hours of childcare. So that's where it starts to impact on our childcare providers as well. And most of them are women and we don't want to be um, accessing childcare at the expense of women's quality employment either, you know. So it very much sits in our economic infrastructure here and yet it's never really recognized as that. Um, in the last economic downturn, um, our members um, very clearly indicated that that had a severe impact in terms of childcare provision. And a lot of um, families and parents having to move out of formal childcare and utilize grandparents, particularly grandmothers, as, um, as, as their childcare providers, which um, the grandmothers are telling us that yes, of course they love their lovely grandchildren but any of you who have had small children will know how challenging in terms of energy levels and everything else it is to have children full time all day. Um, also because we were in an economic downturn that impacted on everybody and particularly those in pension age who are not getting any increase in their income or any potential to increase their income and they were telling us simple things, it sounds simple, but the impact on them said if, if it was just myself and my partner at home, we would probably be only heating one room in the house during the day. But whenever we have the children, we have to heat the whole house because we don't want them to be cold. Um, things like have the fuel for the car if they're doing school runs in and out and back and forth several days a week. Um, and also providing meals for those children um, all day um, and, and, and during the week and potentially having to provide childcare for more than one of your children. So several um, families of grandchildren. So it's not that there isn't love and, on, and an unwillingness, but it also is having a huge impact on mental health, on financial health and on their social and emotional well-being because it obviously, as all of you know, if you're caring for children on any kind of a full-time basis, it does mean that you can't engage fully in other parts of your life. So they were stopping attending their local rural women's groups and those places where they were getting their, their social support. So my concern would be that that will be exacerbated yet again in, in this COVID recovery. People will just simply opt out of formal childcare and then, but they will still require childcare. So who's providing that childcare? Um, and, you know, I, I hope I've made very clear that childcare in, in, in our view and certainly in our members view is much more than a useful extra, which, you know, helps women participate. You know, it is more correct to say that with high debt, many women from disadvantaged and rural areas are entirely unable to consider education or work at all. Um, the Women's Policy Group, super fantastic, did I mention that Feminist Recovery Plan report, um, states very clearly and comprehensively that childcare should be treated as part of our economic infrastructure. And we as an Irwin would absolutely support that. Everything our members tell us says that that is clearly the case. And um, some of there's lots and lots of evidence in that report. But one of the things that really struck me is that already we know that mums have been one and a half times more likely than dads to have had to quit their job or have lost their job or been furloughed during COVID. Now, and 
we all have been hearing the debate about how many people who were furloughed will eventually actually still have a job. That impacts on all of us, every single one of us as an economy. So, so saying that this is a women's issue or this is a small consideration is not okay. Um, it was very, very clear, and I know Aoife did point that out in her um, bit this morning, but the fact that they started opening retail and started open, reopening our economy and had not given any consideration to childcare tells you where they think it sits and whose responsibility they think that it is and whose problem they think it is, and they clearly don't think it's theirs. And I, I would say we, we all need to be challenging our government to say that this is, this is something that they need to be prioritizing. And to tell us that we have to wait another several years for a childcare strategy, we're the only devolved nation that doesn't have a childcare strategy. Why don't we deserve a childcare strategy? And also, I kind of fear them <laughs> starting to consult on a childcare strategy again, simply because, I mean, I, I encourage them to do so, but I think, how am I going to go back out to our members and ask them yet again what their childcare issues are? Because they have been surveyed and surveyed and surveyed and surveyed by our government who have yet to do anything to implement any changes or support for them based on those surveys. Um, so, um, look, we'll take undertake the challenge of that when it comes, but I think that they're already telling us it's a couple of years away. Is that a couple of years away before they're going to think about it? Like, we know the pace of, of, that they move around here. <laughs> um, I just think, you know, we're looking at, it, when they're talking in those kind of terms, we're looking at a good five to seven years before we have anything that looks like workable. You know what? All the children who are currently in full-time childcare, not going to be matter to them by then so you know it's not it's not good enough and I think we need to say that clearly loudly consistently everywhere we go so if you're talking to your MLS if you're talking to your MPs if they're knocking on your door we've got a nice shiny election next year uh make sure you tell them one of the things we can look at there are lots of in and say one minute left great thank you um, there's lots of um, good examples across the world of where it works, but one that's very close to us is the Scottish model. Um, and, and it's quite rightly set up there as a good example. However, we would say that there's also learning from that in terms of rural. Um, because no particular department in Scotland um, took on their childcare strategy, um, it has meant that there's a bit of a postcode lottery um, in terms of delivery and support. Um, also, their lack of rural proofing has resulted in consistent evaluations of their strategy, deeming provision in rural areas as inadequate. So we would be saying we need an energetic, time-bound progress to develop an actions to go alongside a childcare strategy which takes account of rural needs. Why not? What's the hold up? We deserve it. And also, it should be based on a rights-based approach. We all own rights here. I know some political parties think that maybe they own them a bit more than others, but we all own them. And if they're delivered on our Good Friday Agreement of a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland, we might have a bit more of a steady base on which to, to start forming that. But that's a rattle through of rural issues. <laughs> Thank you very much for, for listening to me this morning. Thank you so much, Louise, for that. And I am always loath to stop you mid-flow, so thanks for jumping in. Next up, we are going to welcome our final speaker today. Um, Louise Neeson works in the area of equality and human rights in the public sector. She has a master's in human rights law from Queen's University, Belfast. And she is a mum to five-year-old Davog and Connell, who's two. She is speaking today solely in her capacity as a parent and specifically as a parent of a child with a disability and I want to say a special thanks to Louise because I feel like I slightly pushed her into it and she was so kind to say yes. So Louise um, Neeson if you want to take the floor thank you so much. Thank you thanks Helen. Uh, hello and thanks very much for asking me to, to take part today. As Helen mentioned I'm, my contribution today is solely in a personal capacity not as an employee and certainly not as a voice or a representative of other parents of children with disabilities or uh, additional needs. It's also not a legal or human rights based or a policy based discussion. I think the best way to provide uh, a snapshot of some of the issues that we have faced um, in relation to childcare is just to provide a bit of a narrative or a bit of a background and, um, uh, and 
and some information around that. So as Helen said, I have two children, two sons, Davog was five and Kamal is two. And Davog was born three months prematurely, so he was born at 27 weeks. Um, and he spent 120 days in the neonatal unit in Belfast. When he was two weeks old, we also um, found out that he had a diagnosis of Down syndrome. So really the prematurity and the Down syndrome combined to result in a number of health issues for Davog, many of which are, he has outgrown or is outgrowing and some of which um, I suppose persist. So it became very apparent in the course of my maternity leave with Davog that returning to work full time would not be an option to me. He had a significant number of medical appointments, both consultant based appointments and um, uh, therapy based appointments, physio, speech therapy, OT, etc. And as well as that, just the level of need that he had dictated that we, we really felt that child, the traditional childcare options weren't open to us. Um, I was very fortunate to have an incredibly supportive manager and was able to return to work part time. Um, my husband is self-employed and he was able to change his work and week so that he could spend a day at home um, looking after our son and then uh, a weekday and then uh, work uh, on a Sunday. And again, I, we were incredibly fortunate in that both my mother and my mother-in-law had offered to do a day a week uh, looking after Davo to enable us both to work. So. Um, and I'm, I'm conscious that not every, not every uh, family has, has all of that available to them. So really we felt that we needed, Davo needed to be minded by family members for a number of reasons. He was incredibly prone to infection. So even as his parents and family, we had to sanitize before we lifted him, we had to sanitize before we fed him, everything had to be very sterile. Um, and he was just more prone to infection and, and, and took things much worse than other children or, or, or infections were much harder on him than they were on other children. He had a very high level of need generally, for example, he wasn't able to sit unaided until he was more than one year old. Um, so he really needed that one-to-one -one care um, in, in all elements of his care. Um, he came home from hospital with a nasogastric feeding tube, so a tube up his nose that we had to feed him through. And in order to be able to do that safely, you need trained on that. So it, it, it was a skill that we had had to develop and that our parents had to be trained on as well and not something that, you, you know, that other people would be able to necessarily do. He also from, he came home from hospital on oxygen um, and required oxygen when he stayed on it, I think about a month or two um, after he came home from hospital and then he required it intermittently across his first year or two as well. So that's involved nasal prongs and being physically attached by a tube to, to a gas uh, or an oxygen cylinder. So for obvious reasons, it wouldn't suit a daycare or a crash setting would be, would be suitable for him for those reasons. It wouldn't be safe, it could be knocked down, it could fall over, somebody could pull it, etc., etc. And finally, I think in his very early days, he required 12 or maybe 13 medicines a day. And not only did those have to be very specific doses, obviously, and you had to have your, your um, specific syringes, and it had to be um, sterile, but they also had to be timed very precisely because there had to be X number of hours between this dose and this dose. So I think I'm, I'm probably painting the picture that all of those issues combined to mean that traditional childcare really didn't feel like an option uh, for us. And I think that that's very in keeping with um, the results of uh, the Employers for Child Care survey from 2019 that IFA very kindly sent me that said parents of a child with a disability either A, pay a lot more for child care or B, which was the case with us, pay less because they need it less because the parents either leave the workforce altogether or they reduce their hours significantly, which is what I had to do. Um, and also the parents of children with disabilities rely more on informal child care, such as particularly grandparents, and that's exactly what we found the case to be, because that was the child care setup that best met our needs, and trying to find that elsewhere, we didn't think was doable. Um, and in terms of moving forward then, um, whenever he was two, we decided that it would be better for him to go to a daycare setting to, um, for social reasons and also to increase his immunity. Um, he, we researched it and we found a daycare that um, we're very happy to take him and I can't speak highly enough of them and they had children with other um, uh, medical issues and disabilities before. However, he went there for one day and ended up spending eight nights in the children's hospital because he acquired an infection. It just wasn't used to being um, a, a, around so many other children and um, he spent eight days in the children, seven or eight days in the children's hospital. Um, he had pneumonia in both lungs and he had to recover then from home 
for I think four or five weeks on oxygen and that meant that that obviously had um, implications for us because we had to be very, take that time off work whenever he's at home and you're monitoring our oxygen saturations, really the parents have to be there in case saturations dip and you have to act on that or bring him down to the hospital or whatever the, the case may be. So um, then when he was well enough, the, the daycare were happy to take him back, but he needed oxygen when he was asleep because of saturation dip. So that presented another problem in terms of bringing oxygen to the daycare setting, although they were very happy to do that. And also practical issues that you would never consider like Insurers have to be informed if there's oxygen on the premises because oxygen is a highly flammable substance. So it's a, it's just as, as insurance coming across, it, it can be quite complex. Um, um, so yes, all of those things I think combined to to have to affect our childcare options and the impact on us as working parents. And as I say, I can't speak highly enough of the childcare or the daycare setting in that case, but you know it, it just it presents presented other challenges. Also for me as his mother. Because he was so small, he was although he was two, he was tiny and he and, and he wasn't walking or anything. And for health and safety reasons, then he had to go into the baby room, the toddler room. The toddlers were just enormous compared to him, um, and they were walking and running and falling over, and it just wouldn't have been safe. So for health and safety reasons, he had to be in the baby room, which I fully understood and respected. But as his mother, you know, that to me he wasn't around his peers, and he was around sometimes newborn babies, you know, and I was conscious of. You know, wanting him to be around people his own age in terms of um, and bringing him on in his own development as well. So, and saying that, we have, we've had a number of very positive childcare experiences as well, where I've left the children up, we found a childcare uh, provider through uh, word of mouth, and she just took everything in her stride. Now, he was a lot older then, and his, his, um, his needs would have been more to do with thickening liquids and puree and foods and that type of thing as opposed to oxygen and feeding. Um, tubes and that and you know we have we've found a, a few childminders in, in his he's five now so since he's maybe been three or four um, and it, it, it has worked well just because his level of need just isn't um, um, as great as it was and um, I'm not sure what my time is but those are all the issues we faced pre-COVID. Um, in terms of post-COVID really because of his high very high risk of infection and because of all the unknowns and the unknown unknowns in relation to COVID in the early days we spoke with a consultant and a medical consultant and his advice very very early on and much er earlier than lockdown actually was to close the door we he said close your door don't let anybody in don't leave um work from home if you can and we were very very fortunate and that we were both able to just switch and work from home like that. Um, what's interesting about COVID is that the issues we faced are the same as those that were faced by all other parents and that we didn't have any access to any form of childcare. Um, and my husband and I have been taking it in turns to work. So one of us is upstairs working and the other two is downstairs, or the other parent is downstairs with the two kids, which has been busy. Um, it's been really busy at times. You're passing each other on the stairs Monday to Friday, but my, my sense is that that's, the same as any parent or any family in, in, in COVID in lockdown. Um, so yes, it's really been quite the same as, as, other, uh, as other families in that regard. One thing um, to point out in terms of COVID is that um, like all other children, Davok has missed out on his uh, schooling since March um, and the social aspect of that and he's missed his friends and I suppose there's maybe been an element that that's been more difficult to explain um, to him but also crucially because he goes to a special school setting David received his, receives his therapies there as well so phys physiotherapy, OT, uh, occupational therapy and speech therapy so not only is he missing out on what, what, what all kids are missing out on but he's missing out on those important therapies as well and the therapists in school are experts and know him well and whilst we've done our best to, to, to replicate that or, you know, at home as best we can, it's, it's not the same. Um, so I suppose that's a, just a particular um, a aspect of it for us. I'm bound to be well over my 10 minutes. It's about one minute left, Louise. I'm so loath to interrupt. But... Um, no, I think, I think that's me. I think I've, 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 I've kind of covered the main issues. As I say, most of those you know, bigger challenges were whenever he was a newborn or whenever he was up until about the age of two. And thankfully, um, most uh, many many or most of those issues um or many of them have been overcome at this stage thanks 
So thank you so much for that, Louise. It's just um, incredible to be able to hear a personal experience. And thank you so much for sharing with us, because I know it's a lot to share your own personal story. Um, thank you to all of our three speakers. I am going to have a look in the chat box now and see if we have any questions. Um, um, and basically it's referring kind of to that with reference to the recovery plan. Um, when the recovery plan came out and registered check minders seen the proportionate share that they were given in comparison to the rest of the child care sector, how is that going to be prevented going forward? You know, because if registered child minders are not going to be treated as equally as professional as the nurseries, the sustainability is not going to be there to keep registered child minders going. And the statistic, statistics are there to say that, you know, Registered child minors offer the same amount or as much registered daycare spaces as nurseries in Northern Ireland, but we're not getting the same voice. Yep, that's a great question. So I'll leave it to the panel to jump in there. Thank yeah, you. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm happy to come in there and I think it's, I think it's a really important point. Um, certainly my experience is we've had many parents and child minders contacting our, our advice service and parents have just been um, you know, overwhelmed by the support that they've received from child minders and been so grateful, um, key worker families, uh, we're so grateful to child minders who stayed open um, during the pandemic. And um, I, I think it is really vital going forward that we make sure whatever investment is made in the sector, it is properly targeted so that parents can access the childcare that they need. And that includes in a childminder setting. Um, it'll depend on the needs of the, the family, what's appropriate for them, but also that childminders, you know, who are self-employed um, people and are providing a really exceptional service and um, that they get the, the support that they need as well. So I, I think that is going to be really important in the childcare strategy. And I think that's why I think um, we need to use um, all of the, the vast amounts of evidence and Louise you know, pointed to this. We have so much information and um, we, we don't have to start you know, from a, a blank page. We've got all of the evidence there which shows how important this investment is. And I actually think the learning from COVID needs to then be layered on top of that to inform a strategy that supports child minders um, as well as supporting um, the, the day nurseries. We've got a new all party group um, set up so that's that's led by MLAs but I think that'll be an important um, uh, an important forum um, and um, certainly I've heard a lot from registered child minders um, and I think those voices are being passed on and are now being heard. Um, if I could just add to that that um, coming from the women's sector point of view and, and it's very clearly articulated in the feminist recovery plan for COVID is that in relation to workers in the childcare you know, there's consistently been an undervaluing of care work, paid and unpaid. I mean, women's position in society has always been undervalued, but also underinvested then. Um, and there's a real gender segregation in the sector with lots of childcare workers earning below the living wage. Our position in the women's sector would be that we support every woman providing childcare. We will be advocating when we're advocating for childcare. It will not be at the expense of childcare provision and childcare providers. Um, we want um, our government to support quality, affordable childcare for all, but absolutely not at the expense of those who are providing it. I mean, they need to understand that the, the women who are involved in delivering childcare need um, to be adequately resourced for the important job that we do. I think we all can agree that the childcare providers, um, I mean, the whole point is that we rely on them so much <laughs> and, and, and we want them to, to, be, to be paid and resourced um, adequately. Of course we do. Yeah, and sorry, if I can just add, I think that that is another, I mean, the focus today is the right to childcare. And I think that is a really important right for anybody who's providing this um, care that they have a right to be recognised as a skilled professional workforce who we're entrusting with the care and education and development of our children. It, it's such a vital service. Um, and listening to, um, you know, to Louise as well and the experience of, of your family, um, 
you know, you would rely so heavily on a childcare provider to be able to provide that nurturing care and to provide the additional support that you would need. Um, so that has to be adequately reflected in how we um, value our workforce. And I think just even from a personal perspective, like I'm a mum myself and speaking to other mums, there's a juxtaposition between childcare costs so much out of our salaries, but we feel like what we're paying for the care our children receive is also an absolute pittance because it's just, I mean, I can't speak highly enough, as Louise was saying as well, I can't speak highly enough of the care my child receives when she's being cared for. You know, it's a huge amount of my salary, but it's just wonderful care. Um, I'm going to jump in if I can, just to ask a quick question. Um, if anybody has any other questions, just put them in the chat box or put the fact that you want to ask a question in the chat box. And thank you so much for your question, Caroline. I'm going to ask the question in relation to childcare, how do we ensure that we learn the lessons of austerity so you know women can participate in and access education, work and training and not be left behind once again as you know the women's policy group saw that they were and evidence that they were during the austerity that we've just gone through? Um, I suppose if, if I step in there first, um, how do we ensure it? I, you know, we have, we are over-resourced in terms of governance, I would say. We have well over 100 MLAs. They're, they're representing every single constituency. Um, we've got um, maybe not always the breadth of party <laughs> that we would like, um, but there, there's, plenty, there's plenty of people to talk to. There's plenty of people who are being paid to legislate on our behalf. Mem MLAs is member of a legislative assembly. We need legislation to ensure that women are not consistently left behind. We need a childcare strategy and we need it. We, we needed it before now. It, it's now urgent. And I think if COVID-19 showed anything to me, it was how critical childcare actually is. I mean, the amount of conversations there has been on the radio and in the news and, and press about um, schools, because somehow our, <laughs> somehow our economy has been tied up with school education and yet school education is an entirely separate thing but they're using it as almost like free childcare. but if your child is not school age or can't access school you know I think they, they need to start on picking all of these things and understand that actually childcare is, is central um, to a, a working economy um, and when they are focused and constantly talking about economy and job sectors and job losses and we're let's I don't want to be the one to do this but I'm gonna we're looking into um, January where Brexit is going to be implemented that's going to impact on our economy as well and if they have to start getting this right and they have to start talking to people and actually listening to them and, and developing an action plan to deal with it. If we have nothing in legislation, I'm afraid to say my view is that we probably are just as vulnerable as ever. Yeah, um, we have about a minute or two left and I think we're mainly done with the questions. So just any one want to jump in and I'll get last question or any final comments from the speakers. Well, can I, I was just going to maybe build on what Louise was saying. I mean, I think um, what would be really important in the strategy when we saw the consultation before, I think there was rightly one of the strands. It was about um, childcare as an enabler to employment. But I think we've got to look at the fact that education and training are also critical enablers to accessing and progressing in work. So we can't just facilitate childcare for working parents. We've got to facilitate childcare to support parents into the workplace and that means also supporting them to access it when they need education uh, access to education and training and i think we've got to mention universal credit as well and um, the long wait to access and um, support through that and um, i mean it's not working for parents it's also not working for child care providers for you know a lot of um, maybe child minders who are also trying to access supports for universal credit maybe because um their, their um their income is um at a low level so we need to be looking bigger picture 
infrastructure, not just at the childcare strategy, but how is it interacting with all of these other um, elements that are making things very difficult for families at present. Um, mm. And I think, you know, we could potentially see it only getting worse. Um, and COVID has played a significant role in that, you know, as we see changes to the furlough scheme um, and you know, we certainly mentioned Brexit, we've got to make sure that we have a bigger um, picture in that context in our minds when we're trying to work um, to invest in childcare. I, I would actually add to that as well that I do think that, I mean, the reason I was mentioning the economy is because they're so focused on that and they still can't see the link to childcare to the economy. Um, but that's not where, where its limit ends. As Eva said, their training and education was just huge for women and there's a lifelong training and education access, but also our health and well-being, our mental health and well-being, much as we love all our darling children and we do. Um, if we are with them 24 seven and we don't get any like respite from that, um, you know, it doesn't help our mental health and well-being necessarily. And sometimes even just for um, normal everyday life, being able to go to the doctors or the dentist or hair appointments, those kind of things are things that we, we might need access to childcare for, even if it's only for a couple of hours. And, you know, we deserve that. And I just see an excellent comment from Victoria Sims here and the health and well-being of our kids too, they need to play. Yes. Yeah. That's something we've all noticed during lockdown. I am going to end it fairly soon unless, Louise, do you have anything, Louise Neeson? No. 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 So thank you so much to each of the three speakers. That was just wonderful. And thank you so much to my co-host, Kira, And thank you to each and every one of you who came along. We're going to hopefully be able to get this uploaded. And I am going to send one final email with that survey. I'll probably also include in it a couple of the reports that were mentioned throughout this because that might be interesting for people. So thank you so much to everybody and we're going to end it there. <laughs>